basically, um, uh, we, we start with uh, density functional theory because this is this was the motivation for this project. So we we, we come from the area of uh, uh, electronic structure calculations uh, where we use uh, uh, quantum theory um, and we apply it to, to simulate the electrons in molecules and materials and we, we calculate uh, properties and processes that happen at the atomic level. Uh, you can do this by solving the, the Schrodinger equation in, in quantum mechanics, but that's a very uh, difficult equation to solve. You can only solve it for for very small systems. Um, so, in, in, in practice, there exist uh, numerical methods for uh, solving the Schrodinger equation and, and for calculating the, the the wave functions and the energies uh, of, of molecules. But these methods are still quite costly and quite uh, computationally intensive. So there is an alternative approach called density functional theory which uh, shifts the focus from the wave function into uh, the electronic density. So uh, instead of writing the energy uh, in terms of the, uh, of the wave function, you write it as a functional of the electronic density. And you have the expression you have here where you have the kinetic energy is the first term, the, the EX is, is the external potential energy, which is the energy of attraction of the electrons from the nuclei, and E cool is the electrostatic energy uh, between the electrons, and EXC is the exchange correlation energy, uh, which is the, um, the purely quantum effects associated with the, the fact that the electrons are quantum particles. Um, so um, density functional theory has an advantage over uh, traditional ways of doing quantum mechanical calculations because it has a, a more favorable computational cost and you can, you can use it on more electrons so you can do a larger number of atoms and, and bigger molecules. Um, it is formally an exact theory and, uh, but in practice the, the last term, the EXC, the exchange correlation functional is not known and we make approximations for this. And here in the slide we can see the, the hierarchy uh, of approximations that are available uh, today. So as we go down the approximation increases in, in, in uh, accuracy but also in, in sophistication and in computational effort. So, so we, we, we use density functional theory for our simulations. And if we go to the next slide, which I'm going to switch now, I hope everybody can see uh, slide number four. Uh, we can see that even with density functional theory, which has this uh, favorable uh, computational um, uh, cost, it is not ideal. The computational cost does not, the computational effort does not increase linearly with the number of atoms, which is the size of your problem but it, it scales uh, with the third power of the number of atoms. This is uh, due to certain unavoidable bottlenecks in, in, uh, in straightforward density functional theory, such as having to do matrix diagonalization, for example. So, um, so um, the um, I mean, the, the, the motivation for, for the work uh, my group has been doing in the last 15 years is to, to use density functional theory to, to treat larger systems, to treat uh, entire biomolecules, to, to simulate biomolecules and nanostructures. And these uh, entities have thousands of atoms. And as you can see from this plot, the scaling of conventional density functional theory does not allow you to to do this, does not allow you to simulate such systems. Um, so the, the effort we have been making is in, in reformulating uh, density functional theory uh, so that its computational cost increases uh, linearly with the number of atoms. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see the, the slide about OneTep. So OneTep is uh, the code which have been developing in the last 15 years and it's a uh, linear scaling DFT code. Uh, I'm not going to get too, too deep into the theory because that's uh, 
material one but because that's a bit outside the topic of the webinar but I'm just going to give you the essential features um, so uh, one that so the, the, the linear scaling DFT approaches is is, is, um, is an effort in a community that has been going on for almost three decades now but uh, and, and various theories have been developed to reformulate the density functional theory so that its computational effort increases with the linear uh, with the linearity with the number of atoms. Uh, however, the, the the earlier efforts of, of linear scaling density functional theory found out that they were working with conflicting requirements. You could either get linear scaling and low accuracy, or you could get high accuracy but lose the linear scaling, uh, revert back to cubic scaling. And when I say accuracy, I mean high basis set accuracy. I mean a, 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 a high resolution in space uh, in which you describe your, your wave functions and your density. Um, so uh, one the, 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 the theory we have been developing and, and the code, the parallel code wanted, uh, is belongs to a new generation of methods where we aim to have linear scaling, but also to have uh, large uh, base set accuracy, the, the high accuracy that you obtain when you have a high resolution set in which to ex expand your, um, your your wave functions and your density. So the base that we use is called periodic sync base set, sync base set as it is on the slide and it is um, it is equivalent to a, a plane wave base set, which is a high resolution uniform um, base set in space. Uh, and you can see the level of accuracy we, uh, we can achieve with uh, the numbers at the bottom of the slide, where we are comparing the calculation of the um, uh, binding energy of this phenol molecule to the surrounding waters. We have done this with a conventional density functional theory using a huge number of uh, atomic orbitals as basis functions, Gaussian atomic orbitals, and you can see the number is uh, minus 7.04 kilocals per mole, and we can achieve the same with the linear scaling formulation uh, with the sink basis that we achieve uh, 7.06 kilocals per mole, which is um, essentially the same number and uh, it is at the limit of uh, what you call a complete basis set. So, so we can achieve the same high level of accuracy, and obviously we can achieve what we targeted at the beginning to do, which is the linear scaling uh, computational cost, as you can see in the middle of the slide with this plot, where we, call, we, we uh, plot the time for a DST calculation as a function of the number of atoms for uh, amyloid fibrin protein fragments of increasing uh, length, and you can see that really it is uh, scaling linearly. So now, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, now we can talk about the, the particulars of this project, and this is the development of implicit uh, solvent models. So in, in our simulations in density functional theory, well, traditionally you, you do a simulation of a molecule in space, essentially a molecule in vacuum, but Molecules do not uh, usually um, exist in vacuum on their own. They are, uh, in, they are often in, in solvent. This is where chemical reactions often happen. This is how molecules interact with each other. So it's important to include in our simulations the, uh, the solvent. Uh, one way to do it is to have explicit solvent, to have a bunch of uh, water molecules, for example, surrounding your, your solid molecule. But this is uh, very costly. Every every atom you every water molecule you uh, you include increases the number of atoms in your calculation. So uh, another approach, which is uh, very uh, widely used and uh, accurate enough for uh, many applications, is what is called implicit solvent models, where it is as in the picture here, you have the uh, your solute, which in this case is a water molecule. That's a bit unfortunate, solvating water in water, but I guess we could have found a better, we could have found a better picture here. Um, so um, the solute here in this case is this water molecule and it is surrounded by uh, a dielectric which is uh, outside the cavity that you can see. And uh, the, the interaction of the solute with the solvent is simply by the 
polarization of the of the molecule by the surrounding dielectrics uh, and the back polarization that the molecule does to the surrounding uh, medium. So uh, if we go to the next um, the next slide, now we can see the solvation model that we used in Wanted. Sorry, the solvation model that we developed uh, in Wanted, and, and here. Uh, you can see the, the choices you have and the choices we, we have made. So the, the first uh, uh, the first choice is the shape of your cavity, and this can be spherical, it can be ellipsoidal, it can be interlocking spheres, or in the case of one that uh, it can be um, uh, defined by an isosurface of the electronic density, as as shown here. Um, then the, the presentation of the charts, again, you have increasing levels of sophistication. You have the dipole multiple expansion, collection of phone charges, or in, in our case, we use the full density of the electrons as it comes from the quantum calculation. Um, and uh, also, finally, the method of actually solving the, the electrostatic equations to obtain the reaction field uh, from the dielectric. Um, this is where where, uh, where the work of DCSC and ECSC comes in, where we uh, uh, use a, a real space brick hole solution of the quotient Boltzmann equation, which is what um, what follows what is the topic of this uh, webinar. So, um, so if you see, we've gone from in this slide, we have gone to the right most option, the most accurate options. For our solvent model, this is why we call it the, essentially an ab initio solvent model within Wanted. We we minimize the the number of parameters and we use as much as possible fundamental definitions and fundamental equations for this uh, solvent model. Um, also, what I have talked talked so far about the solvent model is purely the electrostatic component. Obviously, there is also other components. Uh, such as the cavitation energy, the energy of creating a cavity in the solvent to put the solute in. Uh, this is also part of our solvent model, as well as the uh, um, exchange repulsion energy, which is a quantum effect, the, the exchange repulsion of the, uh, uh, between the solvent and the solute. But these are, are not mentioned here. They are, just, they, are not, uh, they are part of our solvent model, but they are not relevant to uh, our current uh, webinar, which is about the, uh, the electrostatic components of our solvent model and the solution of the quotient Boltzmann equation. Uh, so, um, okay, now the cavity is, is this one density dependent, as you can see on this slide. So, the cavity is not a rigid cavity; it's, it's a cavity that is uh, it's a smooth transition, basically, of the dielectric from inside the molecule, which has the value one to outside, which has a value 80, if you are studying uh, um, uh, water, as in this case, and, and you can see the transition as, as this plot in this uh, slide. So um, uh, maybe this is the point. I have now switched to slide, to the slide number nine, uh, which is the implicit solvent approach and is the relevant equation we have been studying so far. And maybe this is the point for me to um, to, to uh, give the, the talk to, uh, to Lucian so uh, she can uh, describe the equations and, and the work he and Jacek have been doing uh, in implementing this in the DLMG package and uh, in wanted in the wanted observation model. So maybe Lucian can take a, can go ahead and uh, maybe I will uh, chip in at points, maybe make occasional comments. Is that okay? Anybody there? That sounds good. Lucian? So I think Lucian, Lucian, you might have to um, a quick talk again to re-enable your microphone. <coughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So um, let me check it. I'll move back one slide. To the uh, density dependent cavity, and then move. Hmm. I think uh, when you move the slide for some reason, it's not showing. Oh, no, it is. I, I did it, but Lucian 
should be able to do it as well, I hope. So for some reason it's all for some reason the Lucian does it, it doesn't follow. Is now complete. So you get the IQ. So this was the final alarm in Delta. It's finished. Test, no problem. <laughs> uh, okay, so we are on slide number ten. You go on to number ten? Uh, okay. No. Uh, to continue what Chris says that what one has to do is to to compute the electrostatic potential which contains information from both the charge density coming from electrons and nuclei and also from the uh, solvent. Uh, and this can be done with Poisson equation, which is the first equation. In my initial version, I, I had some animation, but now it's all in one go. But we'll go one line by line. If the um, solvent contains, contains ions, then one has to take care of them. And the simplest way is to use the Poisson Boltzmann equation, which is the second <coughs> equation, which is the exponential term in which C is the Concentrations Q are the charges, beta is um, uh, 1 over kT, the so quantity, and the V of R is the asteric potential which blocks the ion to, um, which means basically the hard core repulsion between, between the inner core uh, electrons. And it's blocking ions to, to, to accumulate on top of, of the, um, of the um, solid. Also, one can a simpler equation, which also considers the ionic effect is the linearized field. That's one equation in which one uh, linearizes around zero the potential and um, the effect uh, of the ions is in, um, is in uh, this parameter K, uh, kappa, which is the inverse of the Dubai length. Um, a practical consideration for, uh, for, for this solver is that it needs to be fast and parallel efficient. We have to keep up with the, the rest of one step, which operates already at the grid of around 500 cubes. So we, we had to consider this in, uh, in the designing the solver. And it, it, looked, it became apparent. So I move now the slide. Is that all right? I think what we're probably going to end up doing now is that you say move slide, and Chris moves it for you. That way everyone sees what happens. So slide 11, please. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, right. So, um, so why why a multi-grid solver? That is because of the complexity for discretized linear PDs. So one can. So you know the way to solve this um, um, the Poisson or uh, poisson boltzmann equation is to discretize it on the grid, the, the differential operator, the densities, and the uh, permittivities. Uh, and then to end up with a large uh, system of uh, linear or nonlinear equation, but, and it needs to be so uh, fast and in parallel. So the problem is with direct methods like Gaussian elimination for uh, for uh, sparse matrices, it scales with uh, um, the n uh, uh, n squared or n is the number of grid points. The same simple iterative methods like Jacobi, Gauss, Seidel, uh, SOR, cell, uh, successive over relaxation case a bit better, but um, it's, it's not good enough when you, if you think at the side that you want to work. Um, fast linear transform has a good scaling, but it's, it works only in homogeneous cases and it needs special boundary conditions. So multi-grid, which has also uh, order and uh, scaling, um, is the solve that we need to implement for, for this problem. So I'll move now to next slide. It's a while. Okay, so here I just um, very a very quick summary about iterative methods and their problems. So it, the basic iterative method is Jacobi one, which is in the top equation. You can see so you you start with an approximate solution and you iterate. You get the new value at every point. So, suppose this is a two dimension by uh, by uh, solving uh, solving the uh, an approximation of the uh, of the matrix uh, uh, of the matrix A. So this is you, probably every one of us knows the Jacobi. So in more formal terms, how it works? So you have a linear equation A U equal F, and uh, one, what one does is looks at the defect, uh, which is F minus A U for a given approximation, and then um, you can and using the linear operator, the linearity of the operator A, you can write the equation in terms of error and defect, 
And if you, you can solve that, you are done. You go there or you add it to the initial guess and that's it. But basically, you can't. So that what people do is they use an approximation of A to find an approximation to the error. You add that, that approximated error to U, T, and you get a new approximation, and so on. So this, uh, this converges um, um, if spectral properties of the matrix A bar are good enough. But what was noticed for, um, for this, uh, for, um, for iterative methods which come from, uh, which are approximation of the Laplacian and other differential operator is that as you increase the grid size, the convergence rate decreases. Um, and a cure was found. This multi grid is a cure to this problem. So it's, uh, and this, it rests on the, uh, on the observation that only if you think, if you decompose the Fourier mode to error, if you figure out only the long uh, wavelength have a flow convergence. So the trick is, I move on the next slide now. Is it moving? Slide number, okay. I did move it. Okay, thanks. So that, so multiply, ah, oh, it's one too many now. No, I, I, It's slide, uh, I'm on slide 13. Um, so, uh, as I said, so that, that two, two basic uh, principles in multi -grid. So one, it's you can smooth the fast, the uh, short wavelength with, uh, with a smoother. And then when you have a, a smooth error, you can transfer it to a coarse, to a coarse grid without losing information. And on the coarse grid, again, one can apply smoothing. And this is uh, in this uh, diagram below, you see that is a basic um, uh, basic cycle to do multi grid is two levels. So you start you start an approximation, you smooth it a number of times, then you one has to um, uh, restrict the defect D to the coarser grid, which is has a grid uh, step two H. Um, then one has to solve um, the equation, the error equation for the coarse grid, prolongate back the error, add it to the uh, the guess. Uh, on the fine grid and eventually do a couple of smooths. But you can see that um, now this, how you're going to solve on the coarse grid. So that's it's relatively simple. If the grid is not, is still large, you can do again this thing, or you can do a number of other combinations of those going up and down between grids of different sizes. So it is proven that all this technology works. It's a, in the right con mathematical condition, it's, uh, it scales uh, linearly. And it's a full multi grid scheme which has a certain pattern of, of doing this, uh, uh, doing this uh, transition between different uh, grids ha can re reach the discretization accuracy. So it's as good as the um, um, direct method. So what I like to point here is there are a number of new entities like restriction, uh, prolongation, IH2, and the uh, equation of the coarser grid. So how, what, how do you define this? So one can go fully algebraically and be, have a very robust solve that. One, well, one can use some uh, some intuitive approximation using the the local discretization of the operator on each grid, and this gives gives a lot of flexibility. For example, we decided to keep the so-called geometric formulation in which the the operator A is is Laplacian at every level for the sake of uh, uh, parallel scalability. So we have to transfer all halos have the same size um, uh, at each uh, uh, multi-grid level. So I move. To the next slide now. I hope everyone is on page 14. But this is just an example just to show how powerful the method is. So in this plot we have the, so it's, it's a 3D Laplace problem uh, with, a, with a charge um, given by the, this expression for F. And it, it has a defect norm on Y axis and the number of iterations on X. And you can, so the red and green are uh, simple red black iterations, as you can see, as you, you double the, double the side of the linear side of the grid, the, the convergence the, the, uh, becomes weaker. Meanwhile, for uh, black and blue, you can see that there are overlaps of the convergence rate is, is independent of, on the, on the grid uh, spacing. And also, it's quite fast. So you, you get one order of magnitude reduction per, per iteration. So basically, in six steps, you, it's, you are at 10 to the minus 
below 10 to minus 6. Well, it, it makes a difference. It, it's a, quite a complex technology, so to speak, but it, it's rewarding if, if it's implemented correctly. Um, okay, it, moving on. To the, um, yeah. So, as I said, um, so we use basically the Jordan uh, book, you can find it, not one back, please. On page 16. So the the um, what we have done during this uh, GCSE and ECS project, we have implemented uh, uh, the, the parallel uh, solver, multi grid solver, uh, which is suited, suited to one set of requirements, um, and we follow the standard recommendation we found in the research literature. Uh, and it, you can tell that at the moment the um, package is available on CCP Forge, and you, you can check this link. Uh, and also, we have a report from the previous CCC, which we described quite in detail the um, the implementation and the scaling performance. Also, last year we have done some um, experiments with more exotic NTI communication, like shared memory, or um, um, or some overlapping and this. Uh, the results of these experiments are, are presented in, in this EPUB, are available on, e, on EPUBs at the link you can see on the third line. So just moving moving to the next slide, 15. Yep. Um, so um, yeah, just the basic features. So to recap, the uh, smoother is a red, black, goes sidle and uses the so-called halfway restriction and linear interpolation. I, I, I won't go in detail of this, it's just to, to, to mention them. The boundary condition, we, we, uh, it can solve problems with Dirichlet and periodic and mixed, uh, mixed uh, boundary conditions. The parallelism is um, NTI plus OpenMP with one, only one region in the sort of open NTI region. And also have an experimental branch done by my colleague Mark Molson, which uh, implemented open ACC. Uh, that one is not just fully implemented, you know, merged in, uh, in, the, in the branch. So yeah, so I'm on page uh, 16. It's a DLNG features. Who is uh, changing the pages, me or you? I put it on page 16 now. Yeah, so D, DLNG features, right? One, we, we will merge the list. Um, right, so um, now in this table below um, on page 16, you, I, 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 I show briefly the structure of the server. The most important are for the user the um, public available subroutines, which are initialization, two of them. We, we consider that two, it's good to keep separating the nonlinear part because it has some extra parameters that they might be confusing if we keep everything in one interface. So we decided to split it and DLNG needs for uh, general initialization and uh, Poisson, simple Poisson linear solver. And if one, if one wants to solve the, uh, the nonlinear uh, Poisson Boltzmann, it needs to call also the DLNG in need nonlinear. The same, we have two solver uh, drivers, Poisson and PBE. And the number of auxiliary subroutines three to free some uh, data structure which uh, the solver wanted. This is necessary to be called only if you want to call the solver with another setup. Then we have um, error string, uh, implemented an error, uh, error, uh, an error uh, te technique in which the solver can return an uh, error flag similar to, to MPI. And there is an attached string with an explanation. And the version can be obtained with the um, uh, with the LMG version. So I would go ahead. So the the next of the um, subroutines are the, the ones which are doing the organization of the work on the level two, and on the level three we have the heavy duty subroutines which do all the iterations and uh, and also organize define the data type types allocation, and also the we have the <coughs> some subroutines which take care of um, uh, collect the information about the uh, the uh, solver uh, state, timers, and uh, error reporting. Um, right, so let's move to the next.
I think actually, yeah. So now I, I, what I want to do the plan was because it's too much material. Is I have this slide up to slide. Uh, let's jump uh, to to slide. Let me grab the number. Slide 21, please. If you, if you can go. So. Um, because only if, if you want more details, I, I can go into in, um, in this uh, slide. It's already it's Sorry, to, just to interrupt Lucian for one second. The, um, so when you are referring to slide numbers, you are referring to the slide numbers as uh, numbered by this Collaborate application as shown to you in the top right-hand corner, I, isn't it? Right. Because those are, those, are offset, those are offset by one compared oh, to the slide numbers at the right bottom corner, just to, just to avoid any potential confusion between yourself and Chris. So when you say slide number 21... I'm following what Lutian says, and uh, I'm, I'm using the, the counter given by the Blackboard application. Is that right? Yeah, Great. Yeah. So slide number 21, which has the scaling plot of one tap, one tap timing. So this, this is a, a plot I took from our report, which shows that the um, solver uh, takes about, I don't know, something towards about 20% of the uh, typical computation and it has a scaling which doesn't perturb the scaling of one tap or, or the other one tap or subroutine. So this is a great progress with respect to the first trial of, uh, to, to implement a multi grid solver, which was really, really very poor. You see that the runtime was about four times in, at the low core count and about 15, 16 times larger. So I think we I mean, now. just to add here that before before we did the development of the DLMZ with Lucian, our previous uh, multigrid solver was so slow that it was impossible to use it for any practical application. It, it only allowed us to develop the solving model, but didn't allow us to use it. It was only uh, after the first DCST and the first version of the of DLMZ, the, the new uh, multigrid solver by Lucian, that the solvent model in one tip became practical and usable uh, in actual applications. And, and it doesn't cost much more to use solvent than it does to do a calculation in vacuum with it. Okay, yeah, sorry about this. Uh, no, no problem. Thing. Okay, so let's move now to 21. I'll try to let's progress. Um, 21 or 22? But, uh, 22, sorry, yeah, so, uh, confusing myself. So, right, a few words about the um, the um, uh, Poisson-Boltzmann equation. It proved to be a bit harder than we initially anticipated. So, when we ended the DCC project, the first project we had, we saw, well, we saw, well, okay, linear case, uh, we read a bit into, in, in Sotenberg books, they said, well, you can do non-linear equation and about the same scheme, you just have to prolongate beside the defect also the the approximate solution solves a nonlinear equation, some adaptive nonlinear equation you can see in this diagram. And it's about the same scheme. So I implemented that, put some simple numbers in parameters, worked, it was fine. But then when we tried to put a uh, realistic value for beta concentrations or so, so solve a physical problem, it, it was a disaster. Nothing it didn't converge at all. And the problem is it in this exponential here, if we if we cast everything in atomic units, you 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 get a dimensionless coefficient in front of the um, of the uh, potential. So let's move now to to the next slide, um, which is about a thousand. So slide the twenty three. Yeah. So the ratio between the Bohr energy and the thermal energy is about a thousand, and that made everything to vary widely. So reading against the literature and talking to more educated people, they figure out the only way to go around this is to use is to use the Newton method. I schematically just put it here and multigrid can be used to solve the linearized equation in the Newton method. So and there is one more trick you have to damp the error because as I said, this because of that uh, widely varying exponential. So one has to use this dampening of um, error. And luckily this uh, the Poisson Boltzmann equation has this uh, nice property always you have a so called descending direction. And then you, you can converge in a small number of steps by implementing a bit more complex technology. All this uh, mathematical analysis was done about 20 years ago by Post and Syed 
So you can find this is the reference in which they describe all the necessary steps needed to for for um, for PB to work. So we did this implementation and we are happy. It's it works. It's, you don't have to do any continuation. It just starts from zero and you, you end up with um, with, uh, with a solution. We, we tested. We have the the package has a test suite in which we 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 test all the known um, analysis solutions and also the parallelism with different number of threads and MPI ranks. So we are pretty sure that uh, it, it does a good job. And so moving, uh, if we move to the next. Okay, so, so as I said, this, so we have the solver. Now as uh, Chris has mentioned before, some some changes must be must uh, must be done in, in one step because our extra energy terms and exostatic things have changed. And Yatsik, our colleague, he did a lot of work to, to implement this. So this is a list which it's quite long and uh, um, some of things are, are really at the border of my understanding. But you see, so the static potential is still necessary. So you need somehow to block the files to come over the uh, electronic cloud and the, um, and the nuclei. And so we have some phenomenological uh, 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 static potential added in. Then boundary conditions for nonlinear equation are a bit tricky. What are those? We, we don't know, but the, the people around use uh, the linearized boundary conditions, so we, we use the same. Defect correction that one that has inside the solver needs to be up upgraded, needed to be upgraded to for, um, uh, uh, for to include also the nonlinear case and the additional terms which are in the last three points have to be considered to, to have a proper, uh, to, com to consider a proper solvation energy in the nonlinear case. So now you can see by now this is quite, quite a machinery, quite, quite a complex uh, operation. So that, is it any good? So can, how can we test it? And Yatsik has a very good idea. So there is, there is this package called adaptive pass on Boltzmann solver, which computes solvation energy for classical models of molecules. Essentially, it has extruded volume and the point charges inside. And then you have the solvent outside. And what he did, he, he adapted, he adapted, adapted, so <laughs> what he forced APBS to, to take in a continuous distribution, which he took it from, uh, from a solution of one step. Also, he, he fed in the, the permittivity obtained, obtained with uh, one step and set the proper boundary conditions. So now you, you provide the same information and use a different multigrade solver and you use a different different set of uh, another, another implementation of the energies to, to be computed. And then you see what you get. They should they should they should be close. And if we move to the next slide, so Chris, if you think some any anything extra, whatever I miss here, please please come in. Uh, yeah, I mean I I think so. I don't have any particular comments. Uh, I guess what what we need to say in this slide is that um, you know this is the, the point where the the multi grid solver uh, comes in contact with the um, with the physics of the model with the the other bits that we need to. Uh, develop so that the, the solvent model works. So we, um, Lucian did the extensions in the DLMZ solver to treat the uh, exponential part of the Poisson-Boltzmann equation or the linearized version of that. Uh, and and Yatrek did the um, developments in the one-step solvation model to actually include this, uh, this Boltzmann term and, and use it uh, inside the calculation, inside the self-consistent calculation in DFT. So um, the, 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 the Boltzmann term contains, uh, uh, I mean, just if, I, if I just go very quickly back a little bit, uh, here that the Lucian, Lucian has uh, put in this uh, red uh, circle this term, uh, this, this uh, this term QI is the is the charge of the ion, as it says there. So, if you think that you are 
you're having a, 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 not pure water, but you're having a, a sodium chloride a solution, a salt solution in your water uh, of, of common sodium chloride salt. Um, the ion charges the, are the, ion, the charges of the sodium plus ions and the chlorine minus ions. So there would be plus one and minus one. <coughs> C, CI is the, the concentration of the salt in your, in your solution. So the, the, the beating circle here is the uh, contribution to the uh, potential, the electrostatic potential phi that you get as a solution. But this, this contribution is, is uh, coming from the, the salt concentration. And then the, the, the bit on the right, the V of R is this steric potential, which is a somewhat ad hoc addition to prevent, for example, the if you're having sodium chloride, to prevent the, the chlorium, the, the chloride ions, which are negatively charged, to collapse to the uh, positive nuclei of your molecule. So yeah, that, that's, that's what I want to add, really. And um, then here in, in slide uh, 24, uh, Lucien has summarized the work that he and, uh, and Jacek did to uh, incorporate this in, into Wanted. But uh, very interesting are the, the, the slides that follow with the test, the, the real nice test. So uh, should I give this back to Lucien now on, on slide uh, 25? I lost. I can't hear you, Lucian, at all. Can anybody hear? Lu Can you hear me? Now, yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, um, so as, as I said, so we, we have now in this plot we have a, a comparison between an uh, APBS computation done with the same charge density and the same boundary condition and with the same electrostatic permittivity epsilon. But the APBS has its own way to compute the the um, solvation uh, solvation energy and its own multiplet solver. And if after we after we have to convince APBS to take in the data from uh, from one step, so we get a very good agreement. So you can see the on uh, what we have on uh, y axis is the free energy solvation relative to the uh, pure uh, pure uh, solvent and. The parameter which varies on X is the hardcore steric potential rate. So you expect as if you keep the ions far away from the molecules to be no no effects from the Poisson equation. So you expect these things to, to go towards towards zero. The the, um, the the difference between the pure uh, pure salt and no salt and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, solvent with, with some molar concentration. And this one, what we see, this jagged yellow line is uh, a solution <coughs> um, yes we have found it only if you use it point charges I'm not sure why it looks like that we just wanted to show what's the difference we have to do this very carefully to to, to provide the same information to APBS and in order to, to get to get the, the right solution um, so this is linear linearized uh, Poisson Boltzmann equation you can see it now uh, atom the, the test molecule which was tested it's a, it's a simple one it's an OH minus and in 0.1 molar of salt. Um, and if we move to the next slide, which is in 26, we have a similar plot for uh, for the full nonlinear equation. You see the for a small uh, uh, for the small radius of uh, of, um, of of the um, state potential, the, the the correction is higher. But otherwise, it goes to zero, and perhaps here yeah, towards zero, they, there is a small discrepancy. But as I said, the models are not exact. There are still some differences between them. But I think we are happy with this. And bear in mind, this is a correction to eight, about 80 kilocals per mole, I guess, which is the, the um, uh, solvation correction, the interaction between pure solvent and the, and the molecule. So, in conclusion, so we can move now to the next, next slide. 27 should be right. So this is a timeline of uh, one step 
development prepared also by Yatex, so what happened from 2010 up to now, and this is step by step uh, more refined uh, addition to to salvation calculations were made. So and DCSC project first DCSC project came in place in 2013. The work was done 2012-2013, and uh, the current DCSC project has has um, added all these uh, uh, energies and uh, boundary conditions. You see the full list here prepared by Yatex, so which which makes the makes the computation to be consistent and uh, test it very nicely against another another model. Um, and there is some more work to do. Yati wants to continue with solvation forces in presence of salt. But if we move to the next slide now, 28. So I, I, I'll just conclude that with, uh, thanks to DCC and ECC programs, one step is capable to include solvent effects in DFT computation, which I, I, I claim as state of the art degree of refinement. So now, as, uh, you, you have, okay, there is the steric potential, it means perhaps if one can do also the steric potential self consistently, it will be a uh, totally self contained approach. But the, now the, the de electronic density controls the, uh, it's self consistent with the permittivity. You don't need as many parameters as the other models, perhaps you remember at the beginning on the, on the first slide in which we, ha we had that refinement uh, diagram. Also, um, we have the DLMG package, which is available as a library, can be used by any, any other application that needs us to solve a similar problem. And we are around to help. I'm, uh, I'm around to help if you, if you need help, with, if you want to use it, I, I'm, I'll be happy to, to, to help. And um, the same in it, also for this package, if there is interest, there are many things to, to complete and to do, and I, I hope I'll, I'll, I'll keep doing that. And I close here, thanking you for your attention. Right, okay, thank you very much, Lucien. Uh, Chris, do you have any, anything to add? Um, <coughs> Well, not, not very much. I think uh, I would like to thank Lucien for for the presentation and, and for the the nice work that he did. That we have uh, this capability now. Um, the DLMG package, uh, as he said, is, um, uh, is is available also for others to use. Um, it is uh, the DLMG is, is like a standalone uh, software package that compiles together with wanted, but it lives in its own separate directory. So in this way, it can be uh, included also in other codes. Uh, Lucian has made it available online uh, uh, with a free DSD license, so the others can download it and use it, and it also has good uh, documentation. Um, and, um, and, and basically, I just want to uh, just to reiterate really that uh, thanks to the DCSC, uh, the previous DCSC that started the, the, uh, the DLMG package and the current ECSC that allowed us to do the extension to uh, the SALT solutions, we have a state-of-the-art solvent model, a very accurate, I think it's, uh, it's probably one of the best, and I don't want to blow my own trumpet, trumpet but it's one of the best uh, models in quantum chemistry and uh, we have one or two papers to publish de describing the developments that were done in uh, ECSC with uh, Wanted and DLMG, so um, it, it, it has been a great uh, progress, uh, very good work, and, uh, and as always we have lots of ideas for the future, so um, lots of nice things, lots of ni nice ideas for, for uh, future work and future uh, HPC-related developments. Um, so thank you very much. Great, OK. Does anybody uh, have any questions for Chris or for Lucian, either about one tap or about uh, the multigrid solver? Okay, so one thing I was wondering about is what kind of new systems have people been trying, have been using uh, the new multigrid solver uh, to analyze? What, what, is, what kind of systems have been sped up so much that uh, you can now really make a lot of advances? Uh, so in, um, in my group, we use it a lot to study um, biomolecular uh, systems. We do uh, a lot of um, uh, drug optimization type of applications where we 
<coughs> we study interaction of proteins with small molecules. <coughs> and, for, and to get this right, it is in, in essential, it is indispensable to use the solvent. So we, we simulate entire proteins uh, in water uh, interacting with various drug-like molecules. Uh, others, I know from other, you, other groups that uh, use OneTEP that they have used it to, to simulate um, uh, surfaces of uh, silica in, in contact with water and, and, and functionalization of surfaces of silica. Um, I, I know applications which include uh, also uh, interaction of uh, uh, what are they? They are um, uh, fullerenes, uh, fullerenes with with uh, 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 biomolecules in, in water. This is to study toxicity of uh, carbon nanostructures. Uh, another application has been to, um, uh, to study catalysis in biomolecular systems. This is uh, catalysis in enzymes where um, we, uh, wanted, uh, you, um, uh, want, want, groups that use wanted have tried both explicit water and implicit uh, solvent water, uh, both cases. Um, so there's a lot of applications. These are just examples of applications that have happened in the last uh, year, year and a half since we have the the first solvent model available in Wanted from the DCSC project. So uh, I think the the uh, the new work once we complete the code because we're still tuning various things, especially in terms of the, the steric potential and the uh, just to, to make sure we get the, the best physical results. Uh, I think this will be used uh, a lot as well, uh, especially in biomolecular simulations because using water is, is, is one thing, but uh, often uh, biomolecular uh, processes happen in, in, in saline solutions. So. Uh, including the salt uh, concentration is, is also important and, and this will, um, will be a, a very useful capability. Okay, cool. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much to both of you, Lucian and Chris. Um, oh, I think somebody has a question. Uh, Oliver, perhaps? Can you see in the chat window? Chris yeah. and Sorry. Lucian. Oops. Uh, So this is about Lucian and the levels of uh, course course grade in the multi grade, right? Lucian, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so uh, what we did exactly what we course the grid and um, uh, the. Um, uh, so what happens? Some of the NPI runs became inactive, and the, uh, the smallest and the, and the smallest uh, of the courses, courses grid, you, you might have typically it's only one NPI run which does the computation, and then it has to transfer back. But if you look in the report, you see that the time spent on the uh, low levels or the coarser, coarser levels is it, it, not that important. So that um, that's how it how, that how how it works. It just drops the MPI ranks. So it, it doesn't it doesn't aggregate the um, the courses grid. It just keeps the parallels going as far as it can. And the MPI ranks became active or inactive as it goes through the levels. And I hope this this was the this was the question was answered. Like Does that uh, yes? Does that answer your question, Oliver? Give you a chance to type that out, what the follow-up is. Yeah, I, 
In fact, Oliver, I can give you I can give Oliver permission to speak. Yes, why not? Um, yeah, so um, as, as the scale we operate, so this is not CSD size, it's still, um, it, it, it's still, uh, it's manageable size. So, uh, so one tap, we haven't seen any, uh, the, the scale is not ideal in uh, as you increase the number of cores, but I think it, it's it's still good. So it's um, um, it, it, it's not a problem at the moment. As I said, we had some exploratory work done uh, last year, which you looked at a, a smarter MPI that to to try to reduce the communication time. But for the range of for the range in which one tap operates. It's fine. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? So Dominic is typing something. Yes, agreed. Okay, uh, so uh, thanks everyone for um, attending as well. So if it's okay, uh, Lucian and Chris, I can put these slides online on the Archer website uh, for people to look at afterwards. No problem, fine with it. Yeah, and uh, that has the links in it to the uh, DLMG package as well. So, um, okay, excellent. Thanks everyone very much. Thank you. Uh, the next tech forum will be announced um, in due course. Okay. Bye-bye. 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 It's still going to crash. <laughs> so you see the dust. It's frozen up. <laughs>